Thank you, thank you, and welcome to the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall and to the second concert of the Oregon Symphony's Beethoven Festival. It has come to my attention that some people are attending all three concerts, which I think is absolutely wonderful. We have some right here, way to go. How many people are attending all three concerts? Look at all those hands. I'm coming too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm Robert McBride of All Classical FM, and this is Carlos Kalmar, the music director of the Oregon Symphony. Good evening. So, was this Beethoven Festival your idea? Uh, I kind of. It came together when we, we had uh, Arnaldo here two years ago, I think it was. Mm -hmm. He played Liszt second, and we really loved him very much. And we said, hey, Arnaldo, what are you going to play next time you come? And then we fiddled around with stuff. And in a way, I, I not even jokingly, I just said, uh, what about all five uh, Beethoven concertos? And he's like, he kind of went slightly pale. Right, right. <laughs> no, he really went pale when I, I mean, he said, yeah. Yeah, and he went failed when I said, and by the way, can we play the triple concert on top of everything? Yeah, yeah, that was kind of... <laughs> a wider shade of pale at that point. Uh, it, it's, it must be a really interesting experience for you as a musician to get so deep into one genius's music for not only the three concerts in a row, but all the rehearsals. What's that like for you and for them? At least for me, it's not so unusual because um, matter of fact is I have conducted all five Beethoven concertos maybe more than once. And so uh, it, it's not bus business as usual, but it's not so completely new. It would be, for, for me, it would be new if all of a sudden somebody says, you have to conduct all three Rachmaninoffs in three days. Because that I have not done. Uh, I have actually never done number one. Um, but, I mean, Beethoven concertos, from the very first moment you have a baton in your hand, the Beethoven concerti are around the corner. And the only one that is a little bit unusual, which is the triple concerto, I mean, that doesn't happen very often, but I never, I never documented what I conduct. So I don't actually know, but I, can, I know that I conducted probably each of these uh, a couple of times. Probably the Emperor Concertum, I think still to this day, Emperor Concertum, which is one of the, I mean, number five, tomorrow. It's the concert for piano and orchestra I've conducted the most in my life. Oh, by any composer? By any huh? composer. Uh, emperor, I don't know why. Uh, but it just happened. And, and then how did you come up with the three Leonora overtures? Uh, because I just thought, that, actually I thought that uh, for an audience, I could have imagined that there will be a couple of you who come to all three nights, and I thought, boring to play the same overtures three times. And I thought also, yes, we could have gone kind of the easier way and play Leonora III and uh, Egmont uh, and Coriolan, meaning the war horses, that it's easier for us. But then I thought, no, why not put in front of everybody Leonora, the Leonoras? And to my own surprise, not that I remember this so exactly, but there is in our program books, it's always, aside from the program notes written by Elizabeth Schwartz, which are really very, very, always a good read, she also gives us an overview of the, what she calls the vital stats, vital stats of the piece. Uh, talking about when was the piece premiered uh, and when was the first Oregon Symphony premiere and when was it last played. Now, the surprising thing for me was that at least two of the piano, piano concertos by Beethoven were not played by Oregon Symphony until the 40s and 50s. And I think like, come on, this orchestra has been around for 113 years. What were they playing before? <laughs> I mean, this is standard, this is really standard repertoire. I wasn't so shocked 
when I discovered that, uh, at least to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, the overture you are going to hear tonight, Leonora I, has never been played by this orchestra. Because, I mean, whoever, who plays Leonora? It's very simple with the Leonora overtures. Nobody plays number one. And whoever dares to play number two then is convinced that he has to play number three. Because number three is uh, this much better. It's just fact. As you know, there are a lot of things in classical music that are weird and complicated and confusing, like Beethoven's one and only opera, which not only has two different titles, but has four different overtures. So he wanted to call it Leonora after the title character. But by the time Beethoven got around to setting that story as an opera, three other composers had already done it. And so he was persuaded to change the title so there wouldn't be confusion. And congratulations to anybody who could persuade Beethoven to do anything because he was a stubborn chap. Uh, and then there's the, and then, and then so he, he wrote four overtures for that one opera, and three of them are called Leonora, as we've been talking about. And then there's the final one, the Fidelio Overture, which is the one you heard, for example, if you went to Portland Opera's production a year or two ago, or mm -hmm. whatever that was. Yeah. Uh, and then Mahler, Gustav Mahler, we think of as a composer, but he was very active conductor and very active in opera. And he decided it would be a good idea to take the Leonore Overture number three and insert it between the two scenes of the second act of the opera. Now, these days, I don't think any conductor would do that just because we don't tend to think that operas need to be any longer than they already are. Uh, oh, okay. So Excuse you know, me, have you talked to me? <laughs> <laughs> Not on this subject, no. Uh, do you know if anybody ever still does that? Well, I mean, it has been quite a while, but uh, so many years ago, the, the Leonard Burns sent it a production in Vienna of this opera, and of course he inserted. The thing is that um, it gives the stage director and the set director the chance to really make a huge change. Let's just think of the practical thing. The first act ends, and the first act is in the, essentially it plays in the basement of the prison. And uh, the second act plays in the patio of the prison, so to speak. Open space, lots of air and stuff like that, and how are you going to make this transition? And then, of course, here and there you can come up with a solution that you just lift drapes or whatever you can, and then it's an open space, everybody's happy. But here and there it can get very complicated, and you might even think that you could interrupt the opera. Not a great idea. And I think for that practical reason, um, uh, Gustav Mahler inserted Leonora three exactly there, which is the overture we played yesterday. Now, the but, 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 there is another reason for that. The Leonora's overtures um, have this quality of actually working in a way like a, a, a mini opera or a symphonic poem. Meaning they, 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 they give you the line out of the entire story, meaning it has this darkness component of this dungeon, and the, it, they quote the desperation of the male character, Florestan, imprisoned, falsely imprisoned there, and then at the end, there is this f completely frantic presto that travels towards the most glorious C major chords you can hear, and, I mean, that's, of course, a depiction of light. And if you put that in the middle of the opera, it is so obvious. Now, the interesting fact there is that Beethoven did that trick twice, in Leonora 3, which you heard yesterday, and in Leonora 2, which you are going to hear tomorrow, but not in Leonora 1. Leonora 1 actually has nothing to do with whatever you can imagine, including the opera. It's just a piece of music. <laughs> now, you mentioned that the Oregon Symphony had never played it before. Had no. you conducted it before? Oh, no. Yeah, because it seems like nobody does it. Well, it's just, you will enjoy it. It's actually, it's good quality music. But it's as I said, 
You look at the three Leonoras and you think other than maybe for historical interest, why should you even play number one? I, I, am a, I would put out a very strong argument to play number two. Number two is very, very, very strong piece. It's only, as I said, number three is a little bit better. The proportion work better, but number two is clearly the work of a genius. Number one is like, oh yeah, nice, nice, and it's Beethoven. That's great for you who are coming actually, to all three. Actually, just to, to make it clear, it is good Beethoven. Because Beethoven, at least on one or two occasions, uh, has written pieces which are really just dreadful. <laughs> Even a genius like he, he could do that. He was not perfect. No, really. He was human. Yeah. He was one of us, at least in I some don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and then another way that this whole classical music thing is confusing comes up with, you know, things like Beethoven Piano Concerto Number no. 1 was actually written after the Concerto Number no. 2. And then there was also this concerto that he wrote when he was 13. So you could even think that it was the third one. And it's like, ay, ay, ay. And in terms of ay, 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 there you are in terms of the Leonora. First he writes Leonora 2. Then he, that's for the premiere, uh, 1804 or 05. Then he writes Leonora 3 for 1806. And then probably for the premiere of the opera in Prague, 1808, he writes Leonora 1. <laughs> the numbers are crazy. And then he writes the, the overture that we all kind of know as Fidelio opera in 1814. And that was the shortest of the bunch. Pretty much. Uh, and so tonight we have two of the piano concertos. We have the so-called number one in C major, uh, and we have my personal favorite, Beethoven Piano Concerto number four, which is a very, very interesting piece of music. Uh, and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing Arnoldo Cohen play that piece, because when he played Liszt on the stage a couple of years ago, I was astonished at his tone. I mean, that piano that's going to be coming out here in a little while weighs about 900 pounds. It's a big piece of furniture. It's full of all kinds of high-strung machinery. And you touch this, this plastic key, and it moves this lever, which moves this lever, and then this thing slaps against the string. It's this glorified Rube Goldberg-esque percussion instrument. How do you make a beautiful tone with that? Especially when you're using all of your fingers and you're playing all these notes for 20 or 30 or 40 minutes at a time. And he is... A genius at that. He makes it sound organic, like flowers blooming. Yeah, he's one of those pianists. I mean, he's one of those pianists that are, at least I can think it's the case, he's not, a, not really what you call flashy. There is no hair flying around, and there is... Uh, <laughs> he's got that covered, after all. <laughs> and he also... I mean, they're even in his gestures at the piano, although I'm pretty busy, I don't observe him that much, but it's pretty, m it's what it is, meaning it's about the music and that's all. But still he manages to, to get a sound out of that instrument that is astonishing. Yesterday, this was a coincidence, it doesn't happen. I mean, y this is one of the things you don't plan for. At the very end of the the second movement of the second piano concerto, there is this cadenza for the piano that ends very quietly. And I have heard yesterday Arnaldo playing the softest piano tone I've ever heard in my life. I thought, well, I hope that the people up there in the gallery who have actually heard it because the tone was still there, but it was like, it was like when you sometimes hear uh, Yoshi, our principal clarinet, really going into, hey, Yoshi, play really soft, and Yoshi like, Ooh, and you don't hear anything, but the tone, the music is there. Several years ago, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, Angela Hewitt played the Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto on this stage, and the piece begins with the piano alone. The orchestra hasn't played a note yet. And 
which is kind of startling in a way, and certainly was in Beethoven's time, but when Angela sat down, she really startled us because she arpeggiated the first chord. And I had never heard anyone do that, and I thought it was so beautiful. And then I just learned at a lecture a couple of years ago at Sherman Clay, Moe's Pianos in the Pearl, that there was this big thing for a long time about Beethoven's Fourth Piano Concerto being a representation of the story of Orpheus. And for a while, there was this fad of pianists doing all this harp-like stuff at the beginning of the piece, and Angela referred to that, which is that one arpeggio. Uh, I can, well, I don't, can't clarify that, but I know where it, I can imagine where it comes from, because you said Angela Hewitt. Angela Hewitt, as we all know, is a specialist in Johann Sebastian Bach music, and here and there goes a little into Mozart and maybe Beethoven, and that's I think that's as far as she wants to go. Handel, Ravel, Messer. Well, Handel, of course, and Ravel is a very special thing for her. What's cool about her is that she researches everyone she plays. Oh, well. And I like that. Yeah, yeah, and she, she's a wonderful pianist. Anyhow, I think the idea of arpeggiating the first course come, chord comes from the Baroque tradition. Because in the Baroque tradition, you just don't play all the fingers at once. You very often, without the composer writing it down, you just go blah, 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 and there it is. Now, uh, because we start talking about the piano concerto number four, the piano concerto number four is the last concerto that Beethoven actually, in a way, wrote for himself and premiered himself. And this is also the first piano concerto where Beethoven takes a giant step in the development of the genre concerto into a very different direction. Because the first three piano concertos sound, sound, although they really sound like Beethoven and they are masterworks, they sound uh, like Mozart with more drama and stubbornness <laughs> in a way. But this, uh, the thing that you always, at least when I read about that and when I reflect upon these things, I wish I could be sometimes in a concert hall back then and experiencing this miracle that we all don't even think about. Because if you even went to concerts here and there at that time, uh, in the early 1800s, you probably had a certain expectation of harmony and a certain expectation of how the piece is built and how the piece works. And if you look at the first three piano concertos by Beethoven, they structurally work like a piano concerto by Mozart, which means the soloist comes out, sits down, shuts up. The orchestra develops all the material that is going to be talked about in the first movement, and then the pianist finally takes over and leads the way through the rest of the movement. And that happens in pretty much all Mozart concertos and in, for sure in the first three Beethoven concertos. And now we are in this wonderful year when Beethoven premieres the piano concerto number four, and everybody in the room expects maybe something new because they know, well, it's Beethoven, a mind of his own for sure. And he comes out and he starts to play and not the orchestra. And the next surprise, in a way, is also the way the orchestra enters the piece, because I should have, well, you don't want to hear me playing the piano, trust me, but um, you, I could demonstrate because the miracle of the fourth piano concerto in the first movement is the harmony. The fact that the piece actually starts in the right key with the pianist playing is like Oh my God, where is the orchestra? And it sounds a little bit like a very short improvisation. And it ends on, it doesn't end with the main key, it ends on the dominante. And then the orchestra for the first time appears, but the orchestra appears in what I would say, I mean, it's really not the wrong harmony, but it's not the harmony that you expect. 
And this moment of miracle where you're like, oh, I would like to witness that. I probably, I don't know, because we in our 21st century, we have, uh, even in classical music, we have pretty much heard it all, and nothing can really shock us in the way that probably Beethoven shocked the audience. But I could imagine that, that if I went to a concert in 2000 and God knows, three, two, one, no, it was in Britain in 1990. Five. You re I don't know if uh, probably many of you attended our uh, subscription concert and in one of these uh, subscription concerts we played a very short piece by Thomas Ades called Powder Her Face. I think that was probably my closest to because he makes sounds with an orchestra that you actually think he's nuts. And he's, he's not, he's just very good. <laughs> and, the, and Beethoven just goes and then the orchestra goes in a very awkward key. And this is not the only thing that for a Beethoven piano concerto, we all should be aware that it's just strange. It is strange that a man like Beethoven, whom we know as very stubborn, extremely temperamental, and really very dramatic, then writes a piano concerto, his number four, and you have on stage two trumpets and a timpanist, so you expect like, mm, it's coming, but you have to wait 25 minutes until that happens because they don't say a word in the first movement and they for sure don't, don't say anything in the second movement. And that, the tenderness of the first piano concerto, at least in the first movement, is astounding. Even the calmness. This is the only piano concerto by Beethoven that he, where the tempo marking says allegro moderato, meaning moderately fast. All the others are at least Fast or fast con brio, meaning, let's go. We have to get this over with. So, and, and then the thing with, the, because you said Orpheus. The, the, the thing with Orpheus, which I think it's like, it's an idea that comes so much from the romantic understanding of music. I think it's really, it's so wrong. But anyway, it was, it's, the second movement of Beethoven Piano Concerto, number four, allegedly is Orpheus taming the Furies, the, the wild animals. And this idea was created by Franz Liszt. And I think, I mean, I've, I read that fairly recently because I, did, I, I, I didn't read so much about this piece the last time I did it which was quite a while ago. And um, I was surprised because I thought, I, I have done this piece many times and I've never thought of Orpheus and the Furies. I just, actually, I, uh, in the second movement, for me, it's just music. <laughs> there is no story. There but is it is, you can, you can imagine why somebody would dream up a story because it's really compelling, unusual music with the piano making these very soft statements and then the strings in unison oh, yeah. answering so vehemently and then the piano again gently. This thing they have going back and forth is really weird and beautiful and, and it's part of why I love the piece so much. That, that movement is great and then I mean of course it, uh, this is not the only piano concerto where the second movement goes into the third. I, I, it has to go into the third. You cannot pause there. Um, and the funny thing is that the third movement actually also starts in the wrong key. I mean, it's, sorry, no, no. It should start in G major, and, but it's Beethoven. He starts in a different one. What can you do with people like that? I mean, really. You can only play them over and over. <laughs> people are just no damn good, you know? Mm. Your program book for tonight. We have to say something about piano concerto number one. Right? We, we don't have much time. Uh, but I, uh, 
little. Has a lot of information on the upcoming season. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. The piano concerto number one, I, I know that we confuse everybody with that. It's actually his piano concerto number two. And it only has the number one because it was published before the number two, which we played yesterday. This actually is a very standard piano concerto in the tradition of Mr. Mozart and so on. The fascinating thing about this piece is that um, it's the first piano concerto where there is a lot of the documentation about the effect that Beethoven had as a pianist on people. Because uh, they probably in those days they knew we are talking about Vienna, by the way. Beethoven had moved to Vienna a couple of months after Mozart died. And uh, Beethoven had taken a couple of lessons with Haydn. Didn't go so well. Well, Beethoven is Beethoven. What do you expect? Um, and then, and people were accustomed to the incredible high quality and sophistication of people like Mozart, and then comes Beethoven and plays in a completely different style. And I always am amazed when I read that he was self-taught, because I think like, how did you make that happen? To play all this, I mean, it's tricky, and self-taught, amazing. There is a genius right there. Um, and that uh, there was even this Czech composer who said, during the premiere of Beethoven's Concerto No. 1 and couldn't touch the piano for several days after because he was so fascinated by the power, the gentle touch, the sound of this man. And, well, that is pretty much what I wanted to say about it. Now you can. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Tonight's chat with Carlos Calmar has been, is being videotaped. Last night's was as well, and tomorrow night's will be. And they will all be uploaded to our website, allclassical.org, on Tuesday. I'm Robert McBride. I work at allclassical.org and allclassical FM, or whatever we're calling it these days. And Carlos Calmar, I'm happy to say, is the music director of the Oregon Symphony. Thanks for all the great work you do. Thank you.